All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Bible class. We're going into a whole new book today. Uh, not quite as difficult as Revelation. There are some difficult parts to it, but uh, hopefully it should be very edifying for all of us to go into this book about, well, it's suffering, right? That's sort of what Job is known for, suffering, perseverance through suffering. Also, a lot about God's grace in the midst of human suffering as well. Why don't we begin with a prayer asking our Father's blessing. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this time and opportunity you have given us to gather around your word. We, play, we pray for the full measure of your Holy Spirit to be among us so that we may read and study your word uh, and apply it to our lives, that we may hear of your gracious mercy towards us in sending your Son, Jesus, to be our mediator, our advocate, our redeemer. We pray you bless our study of this particular book uh, and you would teach us what you would have us believe and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, the book of Job. Let's go. So today, here's the plan for today. We're going to start off with an introduction to the book of Job. I'll give you some background information. We'll, we'll look at an outline so you get the big picture of what we're getting into. We'll go through the themes of the book of Job because I think this, sort of like Revelation, is one of the more misunderstood books of the Bible, uh, at least in, the, in public thought or you know, widespread thinking. And then I'll, I'll give you some things to pay attention as we go through this book, uh, some things to look for, keep in mind in particular. That'll be sort of the focus of our study over the next 10 years or so. All right, so, <laughs> hey, you know, we finished Revelation. I was worried we'd still be going by this point. So, so for next week, we'll dive into the book itself. So if you would like to, for your personal devotional study this week, you can read Job chapter 1. Familiarize yourself with the beginning of the book. Uh, and then that way, if you think of any questions uh, that you have, make sure to write them down, put them in your phone, um, type them on a, you know, inscribe them on a stone chisel with a chisel, um, bring them in, and then if they don't get answered during the class period, we'll have some time at the end for, to open it up for questions. All right? So it, it's, it's not homework, but you know, you're going to be reading the Bible anyway, so you may as well <laughs> read Job chapter 1. All right, so background information. Hey, that, that is actually very, very weird because these, these two things are the exact two things throughout college everyone was telling me I needed to get. <laughs> a job and a date. In that order, too, right? Like, you kind of, you kind of need the job first to get the date. <laughs> Now I have a job. It's really hard to find a time to get a date, though, right, with my wife. All right, so the date of the book of Job, we'll look at it in two ways. First is the date of the events of the book, what time period you know, Job and his friends lived in. And then we'll also look at the date it was written down for us. Uh, so first of all, we don't know exactly like the year or century when Job takes place. Some books of the Bible, we can get really specific and others, like Job, uh, we, we don't really have, we have some guesses. Uh, we have, we're provided certain clues as to when it could be. The first clue we have is, it's sometime in the late Bronze Age, which is approximately the years 2500 to 1300 BC. Um, that it's a long period of time. Uh, but the reason we know this is because uh, the book of Job actually mentions iron a few times, four or five times. So we know that iron was in use, and even though it's called the Bronze Age, they had iron tools and implements, they just weren't, they were, they were rare, right? They knew how to smelt iron, but it was pretty rare, it wasn't in common use. So iron existed, which would put it at, probably at the earliest, about 2500, that's where we have some of the earliest smelted iron tools in Egypt and in what is now present-day Iraq. Um, the Iron Age, I think people agree begins at 1200 BC. That was when, you know, the year New Year's Eve on 1201, they're all sitting there. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, it's the Iron Age now. Throw away your bronze. That's old hat. We're going to get iron out. That was a big switch over between the ages. 
We know uh, that it happened, well, we don't know, but it's likely that it happened before Israel's exodus from Egypt, which was 1446 BC. Uh, this date is sometimes uh, thrown around it to be different too, but this is the commonly agreed on date for the exodus. Is there a... Yeah. For when it happened and when it was written? I'm going to, I have an issue with that. What, is that the EHV? It's in there, honey. It's in the Bible. Well, yeah, that's not the Bible, though. That's the oh, introduction. No. <laughs> oh, sorry, I lost it. Wow. It's Job, Psalms, prompt. here we go. Okay. Yeah, okay. That is very interesting. Um, I might agree with the first one. I think I disagree with the second one. But we'll, we'll explore why. So the events when Job lived and when this happened was likely before the Exodus because uh, one of the things we learn about Job right away, if you, if you have your Bible open, Job 1.5, uh, it says, well, uh, Job would send and have his children purified. Uh, early in the morning, he would burn, uh, sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children. So Job himself is doing the sacrifices, the consecrating. So this is when the father of the household served as the priest for the house, which is before the Levitical priesthood was established at Mount Sinai, right? So it's the father, the, the patriarch of the household would be the one responsible to offer these sacrifices to consecrate until uh, Aaron is established and his sons are established as the Levitical priesthood. The sacrifices would take place in the tabernacle temple after that. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that, what it means that the father is the priest of the household. We'll talk about that next week, I think. Um, let's see. Yes, so we could date it maybe around the time of the patriarchs. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, which would be about 2100 to 1900 BC. The uh, reason we say that is due to the settings that are described, the peoples that are described in the book, uh, also due to the customs that, that they do in the book. Um, also due to the fact that in the book of Job, there's no direct references to the people of Israel, which seems to suggest it was before Israel was a people, right? Before the descendants of Jacob, Israel, became a mighty nation while they were in Egypt. So uh, it, it is likely at some point around this time. Uh, also Job's wealth is counted in cattle rather than like precious materials, which was typical of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. Job's lifespan, he was probably about 200 years old when he died. That's also typical of these older patriarchs as well. Um, he was a wealthy man. He was. For a time he wasn't, but most of his life he was, yeah. He had a lot of kids and a lot of animals. Yeah, he did, absolutely. Well, he, it says he was uh, the greatest of the men who lived in the East, so he was extremely prosperous. God certainly blessed him with these material things. Um, during the sojourn in Egypt, so the time, you know, uh, Jacob at the end of his life he goes down to live in Egypt with Joseph and his brothers down there, all the way from there to the exodus from Egypt, about 1876 to 1446 BC. Um, the reason that we think this in particular is Job chapter 211 mentions Job's three friends that uh, come to visit him. Uh, I should know this, right? Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Yes, got it. Um, Eliphaz is mentioned as being a descendant of the grandson of Esau, the Tamanite. Taman was a grand grandson of Esau. Uh, so he's at least three generations from Jacob and Esau. Bildad is a descendant of Shua, who was one of Abraham's sons. After Sarah died, Abraham remarried and had more children. Uh, and so Bildad is a descendant of Abraham. It has to come after Abraham. Uh, also Elihu is a descendant of, oh, Elihu we'll, we'll meet later. He comes in over halfway through the book. Elihu is a descendant of Abram's brother. So Abraham, before he was Abraham, he was just Abram. Abram's brother, Nahor, right? So it's, uh, uh, yeah, Elihu is also related to 
Abraham. So we can calculate that to be at least three generations from Esau and Jacob, which would put it like squarely during Israel's sojourn in Egypt. So actually that like 1500 date is probably pretty good. I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think this is the best we can do as far as narrowing it down. It likely took place somewhere between 1800 and 1500 BC. Um, so yeah, once again, late Bronze Age, probably during the sojourn in Egypt, while Israel is becoming this great nation and then enslaved uh, in Egypt. Uh, the date of composition, the date of writing, uh, is different. Um, it is, uh, we don't know the exact time period, but we do have clues from the text itself. One is it's composed after the events happened, right? Like things usually are <laughs> written down after they happen, unless it's prophecy, right? Um, so we would think probably after 1800. Uh, the text of Job has some pretty hard Hebrew. It's older Hebrew. It's difficult. Um, it uses sort of older grammar, but also words. The vocabulary in Job has over 100 unique words. We have this word only in the book of Job, nowhere else. And it has a lot of other uh, very rare words um, that we have very limited examples of elsewhere. So, that the reason for that is because these words were so old, they weren't used anymore, right? They fell out of usage. And so we just don't have examples of them. So you might see a frequent footnote in the book of Job as you go through it. Uh, the Hebrew is uncertain, right? The original meaning of this word or phrase is uncertain because there are many words, uh, about 100 unique words, where we don't know exactly what it means, but by comparing it to other languages at the time, comparing it to biblical Hebrew by looking at that word, how it's used in context, we can get a pretty good idea of what it means. Now, also one thing to note is that just because we're uncertain about one of the words that's used, the exact meaning, that does not end up changing any like <laughs> big doctrinal issues or teachings of scripture, right? Uh, it's just an indication that this text is older rather than more recent. Um, the book uses older names for God, one of them being Shaddai, El Shaddai. It means the Almighty. It's used most often in the Bible in the book of Job, second most in the book of Genesis, which was written by Moses around during the, the wandering in the wilderness is when he wrote, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? So it, it uses this older word for God that was in use by Moses around this time. Uh, also, Eloah is an old form of the word Elohim. Maybe you've heard that one before. That's the word for God. Uh, so the text, I'm guessing, could have been composed anytime between Israel's sojourn in Egypt and the rule of King Solomon. So we're talking a pretty big expanse of time. 1700 to 930 BC is when Solomon dies. Um, I would tend to say it's, it's uh, earlier, right? So it's older just because of the, the Hebrew, the language that's used, it is an older form. It's not the Hebrew that was in use during the time of the kings, right? Saul and David and Solomon. Um, so it, it's perhaps written around the time of Moses, give or take a few generations either way. We, we can't really be any more specific. I think, five, and I'm not picking on you, Carol, I'm just, because uh, that's what's printed in the EHV. I think 500 is really, really late. Um, I because some people say it was composed during the Babylonian captivity, and I think that's where they're leaning, but for me, that's, that's way too late. Um, uh, so, this means, though, if it's composed around the time of Moses or before Moses, this means it may be the oldest book of the Bible, the first book that was written down, maybe. Um, otherwise, it would be the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, right? Um, so, we don't know for sure, but it, it may be a possibility that this is the first time God has his word written down for us, which is, that's a pretty cool thing. Because if you look a year ago at Revelation, that's, you know, like the, the latest or the, or the soonest, I can't think of the word, the most recent, the last book of the Bible to be written. Now we're going all the way back maybe to the first. And both of those books have similar themes of the Redeemer, 
the one who buys us back, the one who speaks for us before the throne of God. Uh, both of them talk about the, the purpose of suffering of the faithful, right? Both of them are sort of given a behind-the-scenes look at reality. In Revelation, we had that all the time, right? There's some wild stuff that happened. And here in the book of Job, we not only see Job and his friends, we see behind the scenes. We see God and Satan and all of that happening. Uh, okay, the author, we, you know, we don't know when it was composed, so obviously we don't know who composed it. Um, Job does express a desire his words be written down. It's not likely that he was the author. Possible, but not likely. Um, he, at the very end, it talks about how old he was when he died. That could have been tacked on later. You know, I don't think Job was writing it from the grave, you know, like his hand sticking up. But um, we, we can guess a few things about the author. Author was probably an Israelite. Um, the, uh, the book uses the covenant name for God, Yahweh, um, which is something unique to Israel. Right? Uh, Job is described as being the greatest man among all the Eastern peoples. He lives in the land of Uz, which, not Oz, but Uz, which is uh, around uh, Edom later. So that's Jacob's descendants. Um, Jacob settled in Canaan. Esau, his brother, settled in Edom. So the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. That is south, southeast of Israel. So Job is described as being eastern, which would have been, where he lived would have been southeast of Israel itself. So the author was probably an Israelite. Um, let's see, yes. There, there was likely some use of sources, source material, written sources or oral storytelling um, for the book uh, from which the author, the author used to compose the book. Now, does that call into question divine inspiration if a biblical author used sources, uninspired sources, right? I think sometimes we have this idea of inspiration of the Bible as God's Holy Spirit is there and just zaps their brain and they just sit down and write like this whole book and then they're done. Doesn't always happen that way. One example is the histories in the Old Testament. Um, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. All of those books use sources. They use court documents, court records from the kings. They are inspired scripture. Uh, the apostles Peter and Paul both cite sources. Uh, the gospel writer Luke says he uses eyewitness testimony. So I think the fact that these books, these sacred books, have other sources is not problematic because we have the final text, right? We have the book itself. And that is God's word. That is what is inspired, right? The Holy Spirit uh, inspired people, moved them along to write this finished product, these books. Um, was one individual author? There's arguments that say this was like cobbled together later by a bunch of different people because it, there's a pro, sections in prose, there's a lot of poetry. Um, it seems to jump around a lot. Um, however, I think the, the use of language is consistent throughout the vocabulary while it's, it doesn't compare to other books, in itself uh, is self-contained. Um, the style, the thematic unity throughout the whole book, I think it's all one vision of one author, right? Hum one human author. Um, because like, well, the biggest thing is that's brought against it is, well, it can't be the same person, it can't be one person because they write prose and they write poetry. Well, I mean, people can write prose and poetry and do both very well, right? So I, that argument doesn't make any sense to me, but it's, it's frequently posed as why these books were written by multiple people instead of just one inspired author. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so I, I'm pretty certain it was one author just because everything holds together, everything coheres very uniquely. Martin Luther suggested Solomon could possibly be the author because there's a lot of discussion of wisdom in the book of Job. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, wisdom literature. He maybe wrote Ecclesiastes, we're not 100% sure. Um, once again, I, I think that's a bit late uh, for the composition. Um, 
uh, the Talmud considers Moses the author. That's likely not the case. It's so different from Moses' writings. Uh, ultimately, we can't know for sure who it is. But that doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter who wrote it. It matters, well, like we know who wrote it, right? God. <laughs> that's what matters. The divine author and the final inspired text are what matter. Um, human author could be anybody. Uh, okay, so... We'll go through a brief outline of the book. We begin with an introduction, which is uh, prose, it's narrative. We hear about Job's prosperity, how, how many cows he had and such. Then come Satan's accusations before God. He accuses Job twice. First time he accuses Job and then he loses everything and he still does not sin or curse God. So Satan goes back and says, well, that's fine, but if you hurt, hurt his body, if you hurt his health, then he will curse you. Uh, and so then that's when he starts you know, getting boils all over and everything. Then Job's friends arrive, and they sit down with him. They grieve with him. Then we hear of Job's crisis. This is where it gets into poetry. So Job makes his complaint. We have two sets of responses from his friends. They're organized in a very interesting way. I don't know if I have time to go into it, but basically there's the first set is four speeches. His friends speak and then Job speaks. Second friend speaks, Job speaks. Third friend speaks, Job speaks. The first friend speaks again and Job speaks. And it goes in order of age, by the way. The older per person gets to speak the first. The youngest person has to wait. Then um, that makes sense. I mean, you know, they're wiser. They have more experience. Um, so that happens twice. And then there's this middle chapter. The whole 28th chapter is about wisdom. Where is wisdom found, especially in times of crisis, in times of suffering? Where do we go to understand what's happening to us and find discernment? And then it, at the end, it celebrates the divine wisdom of God, the unknowable wisdom that he has. Uh, so then after this, we move into an offered solution. Job restates his complaint from earlier. And then we get a fourth friend. The youngest friend comes in, Elihu, and he gives a response. Um, and he, you know, Job, Job's friends tend to get a bad rap for like having bad theology and some pretty dumb ideas. Elihu, he gets things pretty close to being right. He's pretty good. So then... The, the guy who knows it all steps in, right? Yahweh, God himself, steps in to address Job. He speaks directly to Job. And this also happens in a group of four. Job, or Yahweh speaks at the beginning and the end. And in the middle, Yahweh speaks and then Job responds, right? So that's also an interesting structure going on. This, this grouping of four is one reason I think this is written by one author who has you know, particular intent, inspired intent in mind. Um, and then finally, the resolution at the very end, the last chapter, Job's friends obey Yahweh. Job prays for them, and they are restored. Job is restored, and then some, right? Uh, we could also think of it in terms of a courtroom drama, because we have a case presented to the Almighty Judge, this case of Job. He's, he's, charges are brought against Job, criminal charges. Satan is the prosecuting attorney who drags Job up and says, look, he has broken your law. He will break your law. He only serves you because you've blessed him. If you take away his property, if you take away all his material possessions, he will curse you. He will curse you, and so you then must curse him, right? Satan wants to break that relationship between creator and creation, between redeemer and redeemed. So this criminal charge is brought before the almighty judge. Uh, Job states his case. Then his friends come in and actually give eyewitness testimony against him. They say, you deserve this because you sinned, Job. You are a criminal. You are at fault, right? Um, and then we, uh, Job restates his complaint, and Elihu gives his response, which is sort of, uh, you know, sort of good, as we said. Um, and throughout, Job is saying, he, he frequently says he needs an advocate, a mediator, Someone to go between him and the holy, righteous God. Someone to speak for him in his defense because his friends aren't doing it. And we know exactly who that advocate is, right? We have the benefit of the full revealed scriptures. Um, that is Jesus Christ. He's the defense attorney, right? Who goes, goes before God and pleads our case. Who says, look, look at my righteousness. Look at my blood. They are righteous and holy. Their sins are forgiven, right? There is no charge. There is no accusation 
that can stand against them. And that's when the judge himself rules on the case, right? Ultimately, he says Job's complaint itself is not valid because Job doesn't know why. Job doesn't know the hidden mysteries of God. Job can't know the hidden will and workings of God. So the complaint itself is not valid, but Job, it says both at the beginning and the end, Job does not sin or charge God with wrong. At the very end, God says of Job, he spoke well of me. Uh, so even though the complaint is invalid, Job is not guilty of you know, criminal charges at the very end. And that's what uh, the Almighty Judge says. All right, so Job is a bratwurst. All right, here's why I say that. Because from the outline, you, you may have seen there's an introduction and a conclusion. The introduction is prose, very briefly, two chapters. Then there's a long section of poetry, and then there's the final closing section of prose. So it's like the poetry is the, the meat of the text, surrounded by an introduction and epilogue or conclusion. So it's think of a browwurst as you're devouring this book. I'm from Wisconsin. That's the only terms I have to <laughs> interpret my world. <laughs> Cheese and browwurst. <laughs> Uh, it is a very creative book. It uses a lot of different types of writing, uh, prose and poetry, but then also it goes into lamentations. It has wisdom literature. And like we said, it even has this form of like legal disputation, legal arguments before the throne of God. This is a very early example of what's called a frame story. I don't know if you remember from like literature class what a frame story was. It is a story... The, the main story that's told is framed by a wider story going on. So it's like you have the story uh, that's, well, I'll give you some examples maybe. So it's, it's like a story within a story, which is what we have. We have the account of Job framed by the account of God and Satan watching what happens, right? So here's some examples. A Thousand and One Nights, you're familiar with that, it's also called Arabian Nights. Um, this king... Uh, uh, has, has an unfaithful wife, so he puts her to death. And then the next time he marries, he, the next day, he kills his new wife so that she can't run around on him, you know? And then he, he keeps doing this over and over and over again. And finally, Scheherazade is the main narrator. She, she wisens up, and she, on their wedding night, tells the king a story. But she leaves it to be continued. It's a cliffhanger. So the next day, the king doesn't want to kill her because he wants to know the end of the story. So then she tells the end of the story and goes into another story and leaves it on a cliffhanger. So this goes on for, I think, a thousand and one nights until finally the king is like, okay, fine, you can live. It's fine, whatever. So all of these stories, um, like uh, Aladdin is one of them, I think. Um, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, you know, Open Sesame, all of that is, is part of these stories. It's framed by the king and Scheherazade. Scheherazade is telling the story. Uh, Canterbury Tales, as people exchanging stories on, uh, they're making a pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral. That's the frame narrative. And then the main text are the individual stories. They see who can tell the best story. The Decameron, oh, this is a good one for these latter days of sore distress. This is a book about 10 friends who are observing shelter in place orders during a pandemic. It's in the 1300s it was written. I'm serious. The Black Plague, the bubonic plague was going on. So it's about 10 friends in Italy who stay in a, a nice Italian villa. Tough life, I know. But they, they're stuck there because they don't want to get the plague. So they entertain themselves. They pass the time by seeing who can tell the best story. So each of the 10 friends tells a story for 10 days in a row. And every day a winner is announced. So there's 100 stories total. Um, Yes, so that's a very interesting one. Uh, don't read it, though. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> bad stuff in it. <laughs> Taming of the Shrew is Shakespeare's play within a play. The main action of the play is actually a play that's being watched by other characters introduced at the beginning. Sort of like Inception, right? It's a dream within a dream, story within a story. Uh, Frankenstein, the, in the novel, the main action of Dr. Frankenstein making this creature and having to deal with it after is framed by the account of an Arctic explorer uh, that is trying to get to either the North Pole or South Pole. Arctic would be North, right? So uh, trying to get to the North Pole, 
the, the story of Frankenstein gives us more insights into the wider frame story, right? Because this man's pursuit, his prideful quest to conquer nature is called into question by Frankenstein's story. So the, the way frame stories work is the, the main story offers more insights into the wider frame narrative and vice versa too. That narrative, that frame provides us insights into the story. A modern example you might be more familiar with, The Princess Bride, right? This fantastic adventure story is actually a story a grandpa is telling to his sick grandson, right? And the insight it gives us, it, it could be a fine fantasy adventure movie on its own. We don't need that frame, but it gives us additional insights into the fantasy adventure because it's all about boy grows up. This young grandson grows up, he learns to appreciate uh, the arts, he learns to appreciate romance, and he learns how to be a man because his grandfather is telling him how to do this. Uh, so we get this additional insight through the frame narrative. So in Job, a frame narrative, we have the main, the bulk, the meat, right? The broad worst of it is Job's crisis on earth. Job and his friends, their disputations, their arguments. Then the wider narrative is God's court in heaven. This is what frames it, right? At the beginning we hear uh, of God and Satan. And then after that, Satan just sort of like hightails it. We don't hear from him again, which is good. All right, so one of the questions that comes up is, is Job a historical book or is it a parable? Is it an allegory? An allegory is a story that uses like metaphors, symbolic characters to express meaning, uh, usually like a moral meaning, a morality or a political meaning. So if you know the book Animal Farm, that's an allegory. There's all these animals that take over a farm. They kick the farmer out, they take over the farm. The book is not about animals on a farm. It's about the Russian Revolution, right? It's about Lenin and Stalin taking over and trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, take hold of the means of production, that sort of thing. So the, the pig Napoleon, who's the main baddie, is a symbol of Joseph Stalin. So it's a symbolic allegory book. Another one on the moral side of things is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. The main character is named Christian, so his progress on his journey is like the Christian's life of faith on earth. There's characters like charity, uh, superstition, that sort of thing, that they're symbolic. So today the book of Job is widely considered to be an allegory or a parable about the nature of suffering and the struggle between good and evil. At first glance, it does seem to have features of an allegory. Uh, it's poetic. It uses a frame story, as we talked about. There's dialogue between characters that it represents different ideas and ideals. That's pretty typical. Um, Jesus frequently used parables in his teaching to teach a deeper truth. Revelation used symbols and metaphors to express the unseen truths. Uh, parables are used throughout scripture. So would it be a problem if Job was just an allegory or just a, a symbol? Well, I think we can determine that Job is not just a fairy tale, it's not just a parable, but it actually happened in history. And there's several ways we can do that. Uh, I, and I would argue we must consider it historical. First off, scripture treats Job as a historical figure, right? So scripture is the authority on this. In Ezekiel 14, he's mentioned along with Noah and Daniel as real historic figures. Daniel might be the Daniel we're familiar with or someone else because Daniel was alive at that time. Um, uh, also, oh, James 5.11, Job is used as a historic example of faithful perseverance. So scripture treats it like it's, he was a real guy. This is how we know Adam and Eve were real people. One of the reasons we know Adam and Eve were real people because Jesus talks about them like they're real people. Uh, if, if they weren't real people, that means scripture and Jesus were wrong about it, which then we got deeper issues to talk about. Uh, parables and allegories don't have the level of like realistic historical detail that we have in Job chapter one. So you'll notice a lot of like place names, uh, specific customs, things like that. Um, that level of detail is not usually used in parables uh, or allegories. Uh, the introduction of Job is treated as a historical document. The narrative itself 
uh, is written like a history book in the original Hebrew. Um, it uses the word, the Hebrew word, oh, here, this is, so Job 1.1, 1, 1, the very introduction to the character, it's the exact same formula, how Job is introduced, is also used elsewhere in scripture to talk about real historical people. Um, the Hebrew word, that means, and it came to pass. Yeah, it's only one word. It's great. And it came to pass, uh, is used. And this word, and it happened, it came to pass. That is a word indicating a history book. It's used in the history texts, right? Uh, that's also how one of the reasons we know Jonah is a real historical account and not just a, a parable, because it uses this word that the text is saying, this is history. This happened. It came to pass. Also, Jesus treats Jonah as a real character, the sign of Jonah, right? Three days in the belly of the fish, three days in the belly of the earth. Uh, also, Job prophesies about the resurrection of the body, perhaps the most famous uh, section of this book. I know that my Redeemer lives, right? Um, and I will see him, my own flesh, my own eyes will see him. If Job is just an allegorical figure, where's that flesh? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter that his own eyes, his own flesh will behold his creator on the earth at the last day. Um, and so th this is just sort of adds on to the end. Like Job was a real person and that's incredibly meaningful for us because it means Job who now is dissolved into dust back to the elements. He too will have his own flesh, his own eyes glorified in a resurrected body on the last day. Uh, okay, so what is the main question of the book of Job? Many people think that the, the question this book grapples with is why do humans suffer? What's the purpose of suffering? What's the reason? Not really. I don't think this is what the book is interested in saying. I think that's false, actually. Um, because at the very end of the book, well, throughout the whole book, but then at the very end of the book, God himself says, you can't know why humans suffer all the time. You can't know the ins and outs of my hidden will. You can't. I'm the creator, you're the creation. Uh, God says, what is the way to the abode of light and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? The book at the end makes the point, we can't always know the reason for our suffering. We just can't. It's, a lot of it is just the hidden will of God. That part of faith is trusting that that will is, does work out for our eternal good. So some think more specifically the question is, why do the righteous suffer? Because Job himself is called blameless before God. Job is righteous by faith. Uh, so Job is not what we might think of as deserving of suffering. I think we're getting closer. Yes, but once again, even with the righteous, we don't know exactly why the faithful suffer at all times. We do, we have, uh, we have a better than just, you know, like general humanity because scripture has revealed to us purposes for our suffering, how God uses our suffering for our good. Um, but there are still some things that we just won't know because it hasn't been revealed to us by God. So I think this is still why suffering is a little off base. Uh, why do the righteous suffer? Here's some reasons from scripture. Any or all of these might be why we suffer particular afflictions. Um, first is to keep us humble, right? To render us humble. Like the apostle Paul, uh, his, he was given great gifts by God, but he also says, so that I don't get proud and puffed up to cure him of pride. He was given a thorn in the flesh. Right, to turn our eyes to the giver of gifts and not ourselves. To strengthen our faith. Now, struggles themselves don't strengthen faith, right? Because then anyone who suffers would have stronger faith. What struggles do, what suffering does, is it returns us to God's promises. It points us, it makes us go back to God in his word. And that word is what then strengthens our faith. Uh, to encourage prayer, right? Maybe the reason God is giving us an affliction is to get us to pray for him so he can, to him so he can take it away, right? Maybe that's the whole point. But yeah, to encourage a more active prayer life, more interaction in our relationship with him. To teach empathy, to empathize with others. If you've struggled or suffered through something, you can understand it better when someone else does. So you can help them better, right? 
God's power is made perfect in weakness, the Apostle Paul says. In our human weakness, that's where God's power is revealed. It shows it's not from us, it's from God. And so it's maybe pointing out our weakness of the flesh in order to get us to rely all the more on God's power and presence in our life. And also to focus us on our heavenly home, to point us away from this sinful fallen world, to point us away from finding any hope or comfort in this temporary place, this hotel that we're living in right now, and to point us to our true home, where we truly belong, where there is no longer any pain or suffering. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if the question is, why am I suffering this particular thing? Why am I suffering these particular things? It could be any or all of these reasons, or you might just not know. Maybe that not knowing is part of the thing you have to suffer. Right? Maybe that not knowing is what drives you to prayer, to return to the word of God. So maybe God is using that ignorance, that not knowing, for a better purpose. Uh, so I think the question that's really at the heart of the book of Job, and what we should keep in mind as we read it, is why are the righteous godly in spite of suffering? That is, why do the faithful continue to have faith, continue to per, uh, persevere in faith, even when their faith is questioned or challenged or put under trial by suffering. I think that's more like the, the reason. The big question is how and why we are faithful. We faithfully persevere through suffering because that's, that's exactly what happens to Job and that's what is actually answered by the end of the book. Uh, okay, yeah, that's true. This is the true one. So keep this in mind. It's not why do we suffer, why do the righteous suffer, but why are the righteous godly and faithful despite suffering? What's the reason and how can they be faithful? Why are the righteous in spite of suffering? Once again, probably all, <laughs> any or all of these reasons. These are all benefits to our soul, to our eternal well-being. All right, and so uh, key themes in the book of Job to keep in mind as we read what we'll keep returning to. Uh, first one is <laughs> faithful perseverance through suffering. Um, suffering does not disprove God's love or grace towards us. Rather, it reveals God's love and grace towards us. Scripture says the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He wants us to be with him in heaven. And so he will cut away from us anything that can get in the way of that goal. And that can be painful to us, but it's all accomplishing an eternal benefit. Uh, oh, God's grace is a theme throughout Job. You might not hear that commonly about the book of Job, uh, but it is always present throughout the book of Job. God's grace brings suffering to benefit us. And it, it uh, strengthens us through that suffering then. And it, that grace is ours over and above God's judgment. God's righteous condemnation of sin is overshadowed by God's grace towards us. And that's where we flee. We flee to his grace. Even when we feel like he is angry at us or punishing us, we say, no, Christ died for me. I'm baptized and I have his word and promise. So we have God's grace and not his condemnation. So the, the, the reason that the faithful suffer is not because of sin. It's not punishment for sin. Jesus took all of that punishment in our place. And this brings us to our next theme. Job, as I said, repeatedly expresses a desire for a mediator, advocate. You know, mediator is a go-between. Advocate, the word actually means speak for. Someone who speaks for someone else to defend them. And then also the idea of a redeemer, someone who, our advocate who has bought us back. And that's the, you know, the big passage. I know that my redeemer lives, the one who has redeemed me. Um, and that's also, this is also where all three of these themes come together. All right, and finally, so what to remember and look for as we dive into the book of Job? Job does not sin to deserve his suffering. The very first verse says that Job is blameless before God. He's blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So his suffering is not a punishment for his sin. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. Job suffers specifically because he is upright. That's why the devil accuses him in the first place, right? Because he's trying to get the righteous, upright Job to fall, to curse God. So the suffering that happens is because Job is faithful. 
There's a lesson in that for us. Meditate on that this week. That because we are righteous by faith, because we do have faith, that will bring suffering in this world. That's the cross, right, that we bear, that we take up. Uh, Job does not sin or does not charge God with wrongdoing during his suffering or after his suffering. So keep that in mind as well. Though he, he's complaining and he's saying, why God, why is this happening? This is unfair. Both the beginning of the book, after each accusation, uh, he, he's said, it says, Job does not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. And it repeats that after the second time. And then at the very end, God himself says, God says to Job's friends, you spoke wrong about me, but Job spoke right. Job spoke rightly about me. That's why Job has to pray for his friends at the end. Job's friends often have bad theology. They are often wrong, but they are sometimes right. It's like the broken clock, you know, is right twice a day sort of thing. Um, So when you read what Job's friends have to say, uh, be mindful. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't just completely discount it or discredit it. Because part of the purpose of the book is to engage with these ideas, to think about them and test them against what we actually do know, the truth about God, right? Um, and this also shows us sort of the subtle errors of false teaching. Like false teachers are not wrong about everything, right? They're usually wrong about some specific things and they have other stuff perfectly right. Um, so it, that also teach, trains us to, you know, test the spirits, engage with these ideas, and test them according to the truth of God's word. Uh, we can't, even from their errors, even when they are wrong, we can still benefit. We can learn important truths from their mistakes. Uh, and we talked about this. Job's, one of Job's friends who comes in later is actually pretty good. He's pretty close to being right. So it's not all of Job's friends that, you know, get it all wrong. The book of Job is not about the purpose of our suffering. It won't answer why do we suffer, right? That's, I think that's kind of the misconception and mis- how Job is misunderstood. Rather, the book of Job is about how and why we faithfully persevere through suffering. Um, it's not why do we suffer, why do the righteous suffer, but why are the righteous faithful despite suffering? Okay. We will uh, leave it at that. We got through everything I wanted to get through today for once. And we did go late, I'm sorry. But next week, remember, we're going to go through Job chapter 1. So read that and come with questions if you have them. We will go through the lesson. uh, And then at the end, we'll reserve some time for any leftover questions after that. Okay. Any questions or should we all go watch football? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Yes. And that is one of the the big issues of the text too. Is um, is like God is placing a bet or making a wager with the devil on the the fate of this soul that he loves. Like, um, uh, but yes. But it, it also ties into the theme of um, why are why are the righteous godly in spite of suffering that that it actually ends up benefiting Job and Job's friends because Job's friends go away with their false theology gone, right? Job's friends go away justified before God uh, because Job prayed for them, you know, and, and they now know the, the truth of God's word. So, th- there, yeah, so it is, it is very complex and complicated and there's some, like, yeah, uh, some problems there that we need to tackle. Um, I would still be like, I'd still be missing my version. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the, the cool thing about this, and, you know, I hate to call the death of the whole family cool, but um, the, so God allows the, all of his children to die at the beginning, but they are justified by faith, right? So all of that did was get them their eternal reward in heaven. And then because of that, at the end of the book, Job has more children and brings more souls into the kingdom of heaven. That would not have happened otherwise. So like the devil is completely foiled. Yeah. He's, he's lost. He's a loser. His, his trying to bring Job down actually made more souls enter heaven at the end of all things. So yeah, I, it, yeah, anyway, we, we'll get to that though. <laughs> but thank you for your insights. Okay.
Very good. Let's uh, close with prayer then. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we thank and praise you for this time together. We pray that uh, this word of God from the book of Job will be with us through this week and bless our lives of faith and point us to that certain salvation we have through your son, who is our mediator, our redeemer. In his name we pray, amen. All right, thank you everybody. See you next week.